just go ahead. Well, let me start by saying uh, good evening. It's good to be with all of you again tonight um, for educational session number two of four. Um, so this evening I have with me um, Jason Wechter. Um, Jason, do you wanna take a minute and just in, in introduce yourself to the commission? Sure, be happy to. So I'm Jason Wechter, and I've worked as an investigator for a little over 40 years. About half of that time was spent doing um, oversight investigations of uh, law enforcement. And most of the other half was spent doing criminal defense investigations for public defender's office and private practice for primarily individu in indigent individuals who were accused of crimes. And I'm a former board member of NACOL and, and very active in the organization. Thanks for being here today. When we do a training on investigations and reviewing investigations, um, Jason is always my, my go-to because of his time spent, not only investigating, but specifically working in the realm of civilian oversight in those investigations. So thank you, Jason, for being with us today. So before we begin, does anybody have any follow-up questions from last the last session? And you don't have to, I just wanna make sure that we are giving time to questions that might be out there. Okay. Today, um, we are gonna be talking about effective practices in conducting and reviewing of investigations. So over in, that will include characteristics of good and bad investigations, issues and questions driving an investigation, as well as what goes into the review of a complaint investigation. Um, and as last time, feel free to jump in qu with questions as we go. Um, no need to wait to the end. Um, so, and with that, I will turn it over to Jason. Thank you, Cami. So first of all, I wanna thank all of you for your service, for your work. Uh, I know you are doing this on a volunteer basis. You all have, other commitments in your life, and you probably don't get thanked enough for the work you do. Um, so as someone who's worked in oversight for a long time, thank you for your time and energy and efforts. Um, I know this is often um, work that doesn't get a lot of accolades and uh, gets a lot of criticism, but um, it's a privilege to be, uh, to be speaking to you uh, this evening or this afternoon here. So we're going to start off um, talking about the characteristics of a good versus a bad investigation. And then we'll move on to a very specific sample case. And I believe Cami sent you uh, the uh, complaint summary and the police report summary. I know the last session you did ask for some homework. So I hope uh, she, she satisfied that desire. <laughs> um, so if we could have the next slide, please, Cami. So I'm gonna start with characteristics of a bad investigation. So you can see what you should hopefully will not be encountering, and then we can go to the good news afterwards. So uh, characteristics would have a narrow focus, and this would mean it would ignore other possible misconduct raised by the complainant. It would fail to identify all relevant allegations, uh, violations of both uh, department policy and law. It might overlook relevant facts or evidence. It would fail to obtain a complete narrative account from all parties involved when they're, they are interviewed. And it would fail to address inconsistencies in an interview in a subject's account. And this might be uh, taking what the officer says at face value without asking follow-up questions. Um, it failed to hold supervisors accountable. I think it's very important to always look beyond the individual action of a uh, a patrol officer to see what influence their supervisor might have had on their behavior. And NACL had an outstanding webinar just yesterday on the role of first line supervisors in law enforcement behavior. 
I think it will be available if you didn't see it, but it talks about how uh, a sergeant or first line supervisor's behavior has a tremendous influence on their subordinate officers. Um, Jason, can I, could I uh, interrupt? Thank you. Yes, please. So that, that is an interesting one to me. And uh, in terms of uh, supervisors, will you be saying more about that so that we could understand how that would be integrated into assessing um, a complaint or officer behavior? Sure, I can talk about it now. Um, it's, I think it's, uh, to some what they said, is they analyze different supervisory styles, and I can't summarize it as well as uh, Dr. Engel did, but uh, they found that the one that seems to have the greatest effect on how officers behave is the behavior the supervisor models. And obviously, issues of accountability, uh, the first line supervisor is the first individual who should know what their officers are doing. They will sometimes respond to the same scene. They'll observe them in action. They may be the person who receives a complaint uh, filed by a member of the public. Uh, they should be reviewing the officer's activities in terms of their computer assisted dispatch record to see uh, what they're doing. And in many agencies, they are required to periodically review an officer's body-worn camera footage uh, at random, just to kind of get a sense of how, how they're doing, how they are interacting with members of the public. Um, and they obviously also review all of an officer's reports and should be seen, you know, evaluating the quality of the writing, uh, doesn't contain all the elements of an, of an offense. Uh, do they need to send it back to the officer for rewrites? Do they have, have that see clarification? So, you uh, know, based on that webinar and something Cami said um, in your last presentation about how training can uh, uh, poison how officers work, she talked about the officers who were trained incorrectly about using chokeholds in Tucson where they're prohibited. Uh, I think it's very important to, based on that, I think it would be useful when a complaint is received to document the identity of the supervisor, uh, uh, what academy class that officer attended, and who their field training officers were. Because one field training officer can infect all the officers they train with uh, improper procedures. They can teach them how to do things contrary to department policy or law, and that can have a fairly devastating effect. And you probably all heard the dynamic where an officer gets out of the academy and the field training officer says, forget everything you learned in the academy. I'm going to tell you what it's really like. And I think that might be kind of an extreme example, I hope. But uh, the field training officer has a tremendous impact on uh, how an officer performs their police work. And it's a huge responsibility to be an FTO and a bad one can have repercussions uh, for years to come. So uh, I think it's useful to always look at, did the supervisor know or should they have known of the officer's conduct? And if so, did they do anything? And if not, why didn't they do anything? Um, you know, one, one concern you get from officers uh, about unfair application of discipline is they hold the, uh, the line officers accountable, but the higher ups are not held accountable. And I think it's important uh, in the police disciplinary process to hold higher ups accountable. They, they really set the culture and uh, set the mode. And if the precinct commander, if the watch commander, if the sergeant are not enforcing the rules, are being lax, uh, that's, that's gonna lead to certain misbehavior and it has to be, has to be addressed. So just to follow up on that, so what you're suggesting is that when we look at an investigation, a written report, we should also be looking to see whether there was an evaluation of the supervisor's role in this as well? In an ideal world, yes. Um, uh, you need to look at the type of conduct and perhaps the officer's record. Uh, is this an isolated occurrence or have there been prior issues? 
that could be reflected in complaints against an officer. It could be reflected in criminal charges that the prosecutor has dismissed. So, for instance, resisting arrest charges are often lodged against someone who officer uses force against. And the prosecutor may say, this really doesn't meet the, uh, the standards, uh, the elements of the offense, and they will drop those charges. And that can be a sign that uh, there's a problem in how that officer is making arrests, how they're behaving, the force they're using. Uh, Lawsuits are another, uh, another indicator, uh, there, there are a range of them. But, but I, I personally believe you need to hold higher ups accountable. And uh, you know, it's kind of a holistic viewpoint uh, approach. Does that, does that uh, answer that? Yeah, that does, thanks, that was great. Okay, so um, Second characteristic would be the investigator makes assumptions, and these can be assumptions about the complainant, about civilian witnesses, about witness or subject officers, or about a situation uh, based on their own experience, uh, which may be limited, it can reflect bias. I very clearly recall um, I was on intake duties at my agency one day, and uh, the uh, receptionist came back and says, there's a really dangerous looking man here to make a complaint. He was a very large Latino man. He had a shaved head. He had visible tattoos. He was wearing a leather vest. She said, he looks like a biker. Well, I went in there and talked with him as I would with anyone. He was very soft-spoken. He had a very valid complaint, which in fact I sustained, but that was an, an instance of the receptionist on surface appearances making a conclusion about this individual based on their appearance. And it turns out police also made an appearance and they stopped and detained him solely based on his appearance, uh, which caused them to conclude that he must be a parolee at large. In other words, someone who had been in prison was now out on parole and was subject to certain parole conditions, including warrantless search. So they stopped him on the street, and uh, which was against policy. It was a form of uh, bias policing um, based on, I think, largely based on ethnicity. Um, totally improper. Um, so that's, that, that's one personal example uh, I've had. Um, potential bias. Uh, this could be the officer is unaware of or ignore, ignores their personal biases or disregards or fails to notify superiors of real or perceived conflicts of interest. And I'm going to talk a little more, more about that uh, later. Um, the investigator fails to secure perishable evidence in a timely manner. So perishable evidence would be if someone has injuries they sustain through an encounter with an officer, not documenting those with photographs, not securing CCTV videos. Um, these might be the video cameras that a private individual might have outside their business or home, a bank, a department store, whatever. Those are retained for a limited period of time. And if you don't get them within that window, they're gonna be gone. Um, interviewing witnesses who may become unavailable or whose recollections will fade if you wait too long. So again, if someone files a complaint in a timely manner, they come in that day, the next day, two days later, um, they have can identify witnesses or you can identify witnesses through the police report. Two or three weeks later, their recollections may have faded. It may be important to get to them quickly. Um, I live in San Francisco. We have a lot of people normally in normal times who visit San Francisco. So people could be tourists who are visiting the city and are going to be here for a few days or a week, then they're going to be gone. So the opportunity to interview them in person is very limited. Um, disorganized or unfocused. So this might mean uh, an inadequate or no investigation plan, and we're going to go through one, a sample one in a, a little while. Uh, poor documentation of the investigation. Ideally, an investigator should have a chronological log documenting almost everything they do. If they make a phone call, if they attempt to interview someone and that person declines, uh, if they do a canvas, if they request a record or when they ob obtain a record. And so someone who's unfamiliar with the case can look through it and really get a very clear sense of what was done, what steps were taken, what steps might remain. Uh, 
if someone had to take over that investigation, they could read through that, know where it is, know where the investigation is and take over with minimal interruption. Um, unjustified or unnecessary delays in the investigation. I mentioned those gaps, uh, failure to obtain perishable evidence. If an investigation, if a case sits for a lengthy period of time, really need to have an, an explanation for that and it should be justified. Um, the uh, poorly done interviews. And this would include things like failure to establish rapport and put the interview subject at ease. Um, many police officers are used to having a sense of authority. So when they knock on someone's door, they show their badge, they expect co cooperation. Um, when you interview a complaint or someone who has witnessed police misconduct, there's a, a significant emotional content to that. And you can't just go into it like, give me the facts. You have to recognize, be sensitive to that emotional content. You need to take some time to talk to the person before you start asking questions, make sure they're comfortable. Um, John Alden and I did a NACOL webinar last year. Actually, I think it was for the conference. So I don't know if it's currently available that talked about interviewing and went through this in a lot of detail. Um, we, Jason, we can make that available for okay. the group. Yeah. Great. Um, another manifestation would be differential treatment of civilians and officers, treating the officers with a certain level of respect you don't show to the civilians. Um, assuming that their version of the event is accurate or truthful and showing skepticism to the officers. And uh, before I forget, I want to mention, if you haven't heard of it, there's a wonderful series of podcasts now on public radio on KQED that you can find on kqed.org and it's called On Our Watch. California changed its uh, laws regarding uh, confidentiality of police records in 2018. So journalists around the state requested police files and they focused these podcasts using audio recordings of the internal affairs interviews. And I find it absolutely fascinating. And then they have commentary on what was done right and what was done wrong. And it shows examples of them just accepting what the officer says or asking leading questions like, well, you must have been in fear for your life, which is the way you should not do an interview. Um, everyone should be treated the same, the same level of respect, consideration, but also the same level of thoroughness, um, questioning, clarifying, resolving inconsistencies. Um, the investigator talks more than listens. Good investigators know they need to just shut up and let the person talk. Minimal interruptions. You want to get a free-flowing narrative at the very outset, particularly when you're interviewing a complaint or witnesses. Police officers are trained to present information, to testify in court, so they can be expected to give you a fairly uh, clear chronological narrative. Members of the public are not. They may jump around, they may inject a lot of emotion, so there needs to be a lot of patience and let that come out, then ask, necessary questions to to clarify things. Um, the investigator unnecessarily interrupts um, or the investigator asks leading questions or closed questions versus open-ended questions like, tell me what happened. What happened next? Um, where were you? As opposed to, um, were you afraid or were you fearful? Um, did you fear for your life? Uh, things like that. And failure to obtain relevant details. And for an officer, this might be getting them to describe in detail their physical actions. They may say the individual resisted arrest and I used department approved control hold to take them to the ground. So first of all, he says, what is that department? What were you taught about how that hold should be done? Please describe each step of the way, what you did, you know, which part of your body contacted which part of this person's body? How did they react? What did you do then? Describe for me how they went to the ground, where, which part of their body landed on the ground. I've asked officers, could you please demonstrate uh, on your representatives there? And they typically will have a representative. Um, poor analysis for the findings. This would be a one-sided or incomplete summary of the evidence that they've gathered. 
It could be lack of credibility assessments of witnesses, complainants, and officers. And these would be based on established credibility factors defined in state and federal law. And again, Nigel is a webinar that John Alden and I did on credibility assessment. There are certain factors. Um, these are typically given to juries in state and federal court. Uh, and they use this as a basis for evaluating a witness's testimony. So these are you know, tried and true, uh, approved by the courts. Um, so each, each uh, report should, attain, should contain a credibility assessment. I'll talk a little bit about that when I talk about reviewing investigations. Uh, could we have the next slide, please, Cami? So now we get to the good investigation. See so here we have the open, flexible approach identifies all possible violations, including those not raised by the complainant. So someone who comes in to make a complaint is not familiar with police policy and rules. The investigator is. So they need to ask them all the questions to determine was the officer complying with department regulations. So for example, in California, when an officer detains someone, doesn't make an arrest, they're required to give them a document saying you were detained, this was not an arrest. And it's important that they give that because it documents uh, the encounter. Um, it prevents them from detaining people and not having a record of that. Um, so a good investigator would ask, did the officer give you a piece of paper? And if they say, no, not at all, then that would be an allegation that would go against that officer or also in California, many agencies are required to enter traffic or detention stop data in their mobile display terminals. Information about the date, time, location of the stop, the race, uh, gender, ethnicity of the individual stop, the reason for the stop. And this is very important in doing statistical analysis to see whether officers are stopping and detaining individuals in a disproportionate manner based on their, uh, their population in that community. Uh, in other words, whether they're stopping people more because of their race or ethnicity, whether they are requesting cer searches of people um, in a disparate manner. Um, so if, if uh, that had not been done, that would also be an allegation. Um, considers possible systemic issues, such as those involving possible uh, changes to policy, training, resources, or supervision. Um, very uh, sad example of this is about 11 years ago, a BARD officer in California shot Oscar Grant in the back, um, claiming that he thought he had his taser, when in fact he had his gun. There was a similar case in this, um, I think in Minnesota recently. In the BARD case, they, it was a, in one sense, a resource issue. Not every officer had been issued a taser. The practice is you wear your taser on your weak hand side. So if you're right-handed, it's on your left side. So you have to draw it with your weak hand as opposed to your strong hand, which you use for your gun. Um, because not every officer had a taser, this officer had a borrowed holster. It was not on the right location. So that was an issue that of inadequate resources. Um, that's an example uh, of that. And again, also um, supervision. Um, hold supervisors accountable when warranted. Um, it's systemic. It uh, uh, drafts, follows, and updates an investigation plan identifying relevant evidence and witness. This is witnesses. This is something that will evolve as the investigation continues. And we're gonna talk about that in detail with an example that identifies all the policies, rules, and training relevant to an officer's actions. Such that saying, this, what's the law that, that applies? Uh, when a prosecutor charges someone, they look at the facts presented by the police, then they look at the law and say, which elements are apply here? Which crimes can we charge this individual with? And uh, you wanna be very thorough about that. Um, looking at the training sometimes involves getting the training materials from the police academy or sometimes talking to the subject matter expert, the person who does that type of training, to see what are these officers expected to do regarding this, uh, this subject? What are they trained? Um, 
uh, what is the standard we can hold them to. And we have often uh, sometimes sustained cases against officers because they did not comply with the training they received. It can also be an indication of the training is bad. The example Cami gave where you have the trainer from the other agency who is training them to use chokeholds which were prohibited by that agency. Um, they interview the subject matter experts, as I said, um, and clearly documents the investigative steps. As I talked about the chronology. It's thorough. They gather all necessary documents and evidence. This doesn't mean everything under the sun, but everything that's relevant and addresses an issue or question in this particular case. And we're gonna have to go through some examples of that in a little while. Uh, it identifies and proactively locates and contacts relevant civilian witnesses. Um, this uh, means you make, if a witness is gonna be significant, you make some affirmative efforts to contact that person. You might go out, knock on their door, go to their workplace, make phone calls, uh, leave cards, send letters. Um, in the private sector, there's something known as due diligence which means you have to make a certain number of attempts to a, an address where you know someone is located. You have to have confirmed that through certain records um, and you make verified attempts. You send a letter, you make phone calls and you've, that shows you've done your due diligence. Um, has a who would know attitude. And who would know is something I get from the world of journalism. I worked as a journalist before I became an investigator. And it's who, the who could be a person, it could be a document, it could be a piece of evidence. It's something that's gonna answer a question that needs to be answered, that's going to contribute a fact that's gonna help you gain a better understanding of what happened. Um, and avoids assumptions about people or evidence. Um, common assumption would be, someone is arrested for selling drugs and they say the officer stole my money and they used unnecessary force and the investigator looks at their rap sheet and says they have 10 arrests for drug dealing they're they're a bad person they're a horrible person i shouldn't believe them well they may be a horrible person they may be selling deadly drugs but their money may have been stolen and the officer may have used unnecessary force on them so you have to set those feelings aside and say i'm looking at the facts what will allow me to prove or disprove this allegation? Um, the investigation should be timely. I mentioned you want to avoid losing perishable evidence. Um, interviewing the witnesses who may become unavailable. Um, the investigator should be patient, respectful, and thorough uh, in their interviews. So I mentioned recognizing the emotional content, including possible trauma issues of someone who has been a victim of police misconduct or who has witnessed police misconduct. Um, open all relevant information, engages in active listening, listening to what someone has to say. Um, make sure they have an opportunity to tell the whole story, clarify everything, um, make sure they're, they, they feel heard. And when taking a complaint from someone, uh, a really significant component of it is, I uh, say, not just the factual component, letting that person feel that someone truly actively listened to and heard what they had to say, heard their concern, heard their emotions, were respectful of them, um, may not agree with their interpretation, but say, I can see how upset this made you. I can see how traumatic this was for you. Um, and just being an active listener and letting that person, taking the time. So that person goes away saying, thank you. I feel that you listen to me. Um, obtains a narrative account, uh, uses what we call the inverted pyramid format. That's where you start broad, narrow down, getting the who, what, when, where, how, and lastly, the why. Um, clarifying gaps and inconsistencies. So at one point, someone may say something during the interview, later on, they may say something that seems a little consistent. So you wanna say, um, I just wanna make sure I understand you correctly. Here you said this, but then you, you said something a little different. Um, am, I, am I hearing you wrong? 
and giving them an opportunity to explain it. And in an interview, I think it's always good. I, I don't want to make the person feel like you did something when I say, I, maybe I, I misheard it. I didn't note it down properly. I put the onus on me rather than them um, and obtain that clarification. Uh, often someone may have gaps in what they recount. So you need to clarify, did they, do they not remember that? Did they not perceive it at the time? Is this information they might have gotten from some other source, from the media, from someone else who was there, or from, did they directly experience it? And obtaining uh, sufficient details. Um, and let's see, opening the door for future contact at the end of every interview, um, so asking, is there anything else we haven't discussed that you'd like me to know or that I should have asked that you think I should? Um, I always say, We've all had the experience, we talk to someone and it might be a job interview, a conversation with a friend, half an hour, an hour later, I think, oh, why didn't I mention this? That may happen to you. It may happen later today, it may happen tomorrow, please call me. But also say, is it okay if I contact you again if I have more questions? Wanna make sure the door is open for future contact. Um, lastly, it's uh, unbiased, it recognizes an individual, the investigator's personal biases. So an example I could give, I love to go see movies. Now, if I went to a movie and there were people in the front row yelling at the screen, making a lot of noise, I would be upset, I'd be unhappy. So if I got this case, I might think, if I was in that theater, I, I wouldn't be happy about that. But then I say, I'm not in a theater, I'm at work. I'm doing a job of a professional. My job is not to pass judgment on the behavior of these young men in the theater. My job is to, to investigate an allegation about how the police behaved. My focus on their behavior is only to the extent that the police acted in response to that behavior, their interaction with the police. Whether they were being disrespectful, being loud, or obnoxious, whatever, um, I'm not judging that. I'm looking at the police officer's behavior. That's my job. Um, Identifying real or perceived conflicts of interest uh, to superiors and recusing yourself when required. Uh, the Oakland Police Department, where I just finished some contract work, has a recusal form that the internal affairs investigator has to complete, certifying that they have no personal, business, romantic, or strong work relationship with the officer under investigation that they have no involvement with the incident. And that goes in the file. I think that's a wonderful document to have because it provides a record indicating that um, this officer certified to the superior that they were not gonna have any conflicts. If they did have a conflict, well, that case would be assigned to someone else. Any questions about um, this, the things we just discussed before we move on? Okay, so let's go to the Johnson complaint. And so I wanna make this as interactive as possible. So I want to get you to kind of suggest some of the things that uh, we would be looking at in this investigation. So first would be some of the legal questions and issues. Uh, can you think of anything that might this investigation perhaps should focus on? This is just a minute point, but I would want to know that the officer's representation that it's illegal to wear a hat in the theater, that that is absolutely actually yes. a law. Yes, we'd want to look at that law and see exactly what it says. Um, and very important. And then um, the assault on an officer, what are the elements of that? Was that arrest appropriate? So you always want to start with what are the rules, what are the laws uh, that apply to the behavior? Um, what about the police department's rules? What are some of the policies or rules that would be relevant to this investigation? Uh, I would think de-escalation. Do they have de-escalation in, in terms of um, the interaction with the individual? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, 
absolutely. The rules on use of force and de-escalation. Um, what are the requirements for use of certain levels of force? So here we have several different levels. We have hands-on use of force. Um, we have use of deployment of a taser. We have use of a baton. We also have possible use of a flashlight as a weapon. So many departments prohibit use of a flashlight as a club or weapon, except in very exigent circumstances, meaning if the officer's in a fight, they don't have a baton, they're fighting for their life, that's the only weapon they have. But normally that can't be used. So there should be very specific rules regarding each of those uses of force. Um, what about some of the other rules or procedures that would have governed uh, what the officers did throughout the, that entire incident? A couple of things come up for me, such as um, the officer cursing at mm -hmm. um, Johnson and also threatening uh, mm -hmm. people with arrest for, um, for videoing the incident. Mm -hmm. Yes, most departments will have a policy about courtesy and they typically prohibit profanity require that you treat all members of the public courteously and professionally. And most departments should have a policy on right of the public to observe police actions, including filming what the police are doing. So that would be a separate policy. All of those would be separate allegations that would be brought and that the officers would be questioned about potentially could be disciplined on. Um, also, reporting the use of force, um, being accurate about the use of force reporting. Um, what about some of the factual issues uh, that would be, uh, that we'd wanna look at? Some of the questions that arise that, that the investigation should seek to answer. I would be really curious to know if they have ever enforced this no hat policy before. Mm -hmm. Uh, and if so, against whom? Is it in only certain theaters in town? Mm -hmm. Things like that. Right. You want to look at how often is this enforced? Who is it enforced against? Are there any disparate enforcement based on um, race, ethnicity, other protected uh, class? Um, had it been enforced at this theater? Had these officers ever enforced it before? Um, and if so, against who and what were the characteristics of those individuals? Disparate, possible disparate treatment, disparate enforcement. Um, anything else? It would be interesting to know um, what the other folks in the theater had to say about all of this. If there mm -hmm. were any attempts, um, not that it would excuse the behavior of the police, but it would be interesting to know if this, you know, how did this come to their attention? Mm -hmm. Right. So presumably um, the record of the call to police, calls to police typically to 911 are audio recorded. Um, they're entered into a computer by an operator that's dispatched to officers and uh, both orally and uh, in the computer. So there would be what we call a computer assisted dispatch or CAD record, a printout for that officer's activity throughout their shift and also for that particular incident from start to end with all the information provided by the caller to the operator and the information the officers communicate to dispatch. Um, I believe they called for backup. So that should be there. It should also be on the audio recording. So that would indicate what the officers knew when they respond to the call, when they arrive, who the reporting party is, which is who they're typically going to contact. Uh, as a source of information about what, what the issue is, what they're gonna need to do there. Um, Could I ask a, a question? Yes. Uh, so the officers told this young man and his companions they, they had to leave the theater. And I, as I recall from this account, um, they said they'd be good, they wouldn't be, they'd be quiet and so forth. but. Like, where does the authority arrive for the officers to require to eject these young men essentially from the movie theater? That all seems vague to me. That's a great question. It would be the theater owner or the manager. 
And that would be the person they contact when they arrive. And that would be the person who would tell them what the issue is. And that would be the person who would have the right to say, I want you to eject this individual. I don't believe that unless the individual has committed a crime, the officer can force them to leave the theater. So that'd be one of the issues. You would want to interview the theater manager and say, what did you, what, describe your interaction with the officers. What did they say to you? What did you say to them? Did you tell them you wanted them to do anything or they ask you any questions? And if he says, oh, I didn't give them any instructions, then you're gonna have to ask us, what was your authority for telling these young men that they needed to leave? That was one thing I was gonna bring up because I think it says in there that they refused to leave and were threatened by, and they threatened an employee. So I think one of the first questions I would ask would be to the supervisor, did this actually occur? Were you guys actually threatened? Mm -hmm. So forth. Right. Yeah, it's always critical to find out what information police have um, at the start of an encounter. And here would be the manager that they talk to the usher, the information they get from dispatch. You know, we've seen that uh, very critically in a lot of incidents where officers get a report of someone um, having a mental health crisis. And what the family member may say, uh, he's harmless. We just, you know, he needs some psychiatric help versus they say he may have a weapon. And that's going to color how the officers respond. In some localities, um, officers can see on their mobile display terminal information about previous calls for service at a particular address that will flag if they're known to have firearms at that location or if it's known to be a location where there have been incidents of domestic violence. Domestic violence calls are often very hazardous for officers because they're so emotionally charged. They can involve weapons. They can involve violence. So they want to be prepared for that. So the information an officer has um, as they respond to an incident is really critical. And one of the things you'd want to ask these officers, and it's also something you could probably might be able to determine from records, do they have previous experience with this location? Have they been to this theater before? Um, have there been you know, previous problems? What, what have their encounters there been? You'd also want to explore what's their relationship there? Are they going there all the time on runs? Um, does one of those offices work um, a second job doing security at that theater, uh, you know, which, which could create a possible conflict there. Um, other questions that we want to seek answers, facts we want to get. I just want to know about the, um, the deployment of the taser and, you know, where in the policy that falls in terms of what steps have to proceed. It, it seemed awfully abrupt. Yes, exactly. Every department should have a policy on use of tasers. Some specify that tasers can only be used in circumstances where deadly force would be justified because people have died as a result of being tased. Uh, it's a controversial issue. Um, it's one of the reasons San Francisco police do not have tasers because the community has been very opposed to them because of the has very real hazards they pose to people who are in a mental health crisis who might be under the influence of drugs or alcohol. Um, you know, they, they, they are considered less lethal use of force, but in many ways they can be a lethal use of force. Um, so some of the things we'd want to look at would be the characteristics of the incident scene. And here that would be the environment of the theater. What's the size of the auditorium? What is the lighting like? Uh, what film was being shown and did they stop the film? Um, what are the auditory characteristics of the theater? Is this a thousand seat theater or does it seat 50 or 75 people? Um, Just a quick question. Can I ask why that would be relevant? How that would be helpful to know that? It would give you a sense of distances. So if there are 20 people in a thousand seat theater, they may not be sitting close together. It's a, if it's a 50 seat theater, they are going to be closer. They're going to have better opportunity to perceive what's happening. So you want to get a sense of the sight lines. So if you're going to interview people who were in the audience, you want to have a sense of where were you seated and at least have some visual sense of how far that was likely to have been. Could they have seen uh, 
what happened? Uh, was their view blocked in any way? Uh, you know, what were the sight lines? Things like that. Thanks. Um, another characteristic of these would be the officer's equipment and uh, how it was deployed at the time of entry. Did they have batons? Did they all have tasers? Did they have flashlights, uh, et cetera? Um, then we want to look at the interaction in the theater. Um, so as you said, were they yelling profanity? Uh, what was the initial verbal interchange between the complainant and the officers? Um, that initial physical interaction, um, the force used while the complaint was in his seat, the officer's report just really glosses over those things in very generalized terms. <clears throat> So you'd want a very specific description of, okay, where, were e where was each officer standing? Um, how did they grab his wrists? Where were they? How far was officer reaching over the seat? You know, is this a seat that has several feet in front of it? Or is it a fairly narrow, you know, from one seat to the, uh, to the next? Uh, what was the space like? Um, you know, what were the complainant's physical actions? Um, did the officers use profanity? Um, everything about the taser use. And every taser should have built into it a tiny video camera that's activated when it is taken out of the officer's holster. And whether or not they fire the taser, that video should be going. So that's an important source because it's gonna show the taser view of that interaction. So that's a, a video in addition to the body-worn camera video that you would want to obtain. Um, Could I just ask, so any officer, so if we're talking about the United States, any officer that's using a taser, it has that video? My understanding is that um, they, all the, all the, all the ma manufactured by Axon, which is the current name of taser. Um, fun fact, taser stands for Thomas A. Swift electric rifle. Tom yeah. Swift was a um, character in a series of books written for young people. And I think in one of them, he had an electric rifle. Um, but Taser changed its name to uh, maybe disassociate itself with that particular weapon or also because they're also manufacturing body-worn cameras. But I believe they are the primary manufacturer. And I think it, it may be a requirement that they have that camera. The, the technology is very simple. And obviously it's a good idea because it documents uh, the taser usage. Uh, it also documents um, in a printout when the, pre when the taser is drawn and when it's fired and the number of discharges and the how long they last because there have been instances where an officer can make contact with a taser on someone. They have to pull the trigger to send the electrical charge well, they have sent multiple electrical charges in a way that found to be very ex a very excessive use of force, maybe bordering on torture. So that's all recorded within the taser. Um, so we want to. I, I just saw Shannon's hand up. Uh, if you Sorry, to... I I don't mean to cut in. I just want to clarify: our tasers that the department uses does not have cameras on them. They do not. Oh, do not. Okay, I corrected. Do they record information uh, such as the time, uh, the number of discharges? I did just send a message, so um, I'll let you know when I have the info. Okay, thanks. Uh -huh. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. <clears throat> um, the physical layout of the area around the seat is really going to be critical because the officers are claiming he suffered the head injuries from hitting his head on part of the seat. So that needs to be documented and photographs need to be taken um, with a ruler showing measurements, maybe even a sketch of the area. Um, the cause of the injuries to his head, of the uh, lacerations, um, the cause of the injury to his arm is a, going to be a significant issue as well as the possible injury to his wrists from the tight handcuffs. And that's something that could be documented um, at the scene with photographs. Uh, I've seen occasions where those marks will last for some period of time. Um, 
where an application of too tight handcuffs for a prolonged period can actually cause nerve damage where people have gone to a hospital and gotten a medical diagnosis. Uh, also the cause of the officer's injuries. That's gonna be a significant issue here. Um, actions outside the theater, um, the officer's statements and behavior in the ambulance, um, statements by the complaint and officers to medical personnel. Uh, I would often want to interview the paramedics and you, they will not give you information unless you have a HIPAA release signed by the individual they treated. You want to ask them what statements did that individual make if he is saying that officer just beat me in the head uh, with a flashlight. That's a contemporaneous statement that's going to be relevant. And conversely, what the officer said about the cause of the complainant's injuries. Did they can say- Can I ask you a, oh, I'm sorry. I, after you're finished, I have a question. Okay. Um, you know, the statements the officers make about the interaction uh, may be very relevant. Um, you know, were the officers laughing? Were they, what did they say about their injuries? Those are all, you know, it gives you a snapshot of what was happening uh, around the time of the incident. I'm sorry, so what was your question? Yeah, I'm sorry. And it's based on your experience. It's beyond this. Um, but I'm just wondering what's your opinion or your experience on tasers and whether you could have a ta someone who is, um, a, a taser is deployed. I, would you say that by definition, there's an injury to the person? You know, sometimes you'll get a report or an affidavit or a report saying, you know, a taser was deployed, but then we'll hear that there was there were no injuries to the the person. It, it, the fact that it was deployed doesn't mean that the barbs made contact, made connectivity, so that it conducted a charge, and that has often happened where it will hit someone's clothing or they will move, uh, and they just won't make contact with the skin. Um, now, I don't have a lot of experience with tasers because San Francisco police right. and I've investigated complaints against them for 18 years do not have tasers or, or they're often called electronic control weapons um, or electronic control devices. Um, but my understanding is if that the barbs do make contact with the skin and there is an electrical charge, there very well may be marks. Okay, and that, thank you. And those should be photographed. Would those marks be called an injury? I would call them an injury, yes. Okay. Um, it, it, it's a disruption of the skin. You were getting into a medical area there and, uh, and uh, I, I don't have medical training, but they are something that could be photographed. And um, So would, would one expect that to be in the police report? Whether, would, would, should an officer be checking the skin for that or is that really more on the medical end? If, I, think, if I think that would be more on the medical end. Uh, and typically if someone is booked into the jail, they need to be medically cleared. So in San Francisco, there's a nurse at the jail who does a medically screening, medical screening and ask an individual a set of questions about medical conditions, need possible immediate need for medications, pre-existing um, problems and about any injuries and uh, if someone had been tased, I think they might examine that. And again, because San Francisco doesn't have the tasers, I, I haven't seen records of that. But uh, if someone has a, <clears throat> if they don't feel someone can be cleared, they will send them to the hospital before they can be admitted to the jail because they don't want someone there who has a medical issue that might flare up and something that they can't handle um, you know, with the facilities they have at the jail. Thank you. Shannon, did you have something you want to add in, wanted to add in? Just to follow up, so um, to circle back, so our tasers do record when it is turned on. It records how many times it is discharged and for how long. It will also indicate if it was a good connection or if the probes or not, if it was a good connection or not, and if the probes were discharged or deployed, excuse me. And the way a taser works, it has two barbed probes attached to wires that I think are up to 20 feet, maybe 25 feet long. 
and they each have to make contact with the skin and then they complete a circuit um, that will conduct the charge that will incapacitate someone typically make them fall to the ground. Um, but if they don't make contact, if they both don't make contact with the skin, you won't have a complete circuit. Um, so other things we'd want the investigation to look at would be um, uh, the comparative size, strength of the officers and the complainants. And this is a factor that is utilized in, um, I believe it's Graham v. Connor, the Supreme Court case, one of the factors to consider whether use of force is reasonable. Uh, the comparative size, strength, resources of the officer and the individual on whom they're using force. Um, the tenure training and prior experience of, the, of Officer Rice. Um, the complaint history or similar incidents involving both officers. You know, we talked about had they cited individuals for wearing a hat in the theater? Did they have, um, have they had previous instances of removing individuals from a theater or particularly from this theater? Um, you might wanna look at their prior use of force. And again, I'm, I'm talking about the whole constellation of things that can be done because this case is purposely made a little more complex than you would normally encounter because we wanna be able to touch on a lot of things. Um, all these factors will not be present uh, likely in many of the cases you deal with, but he wanted you to have a sense of what could be out there, what issues could arise, what records and evidence might be applicable. Um, the complainant's prior medical condition and history, particularly if there is an injury, a fracture or break of his arm, um, had he sustained any previous injuries in that area? Um, similarly, had he received any injuries to his head? Uh, I've encountered cases where someone might allege unnecessary force, but you need to determine were they in a fight in any other physical altercation uh, in the period immediately preceding that that could have resulted in those injuries? Because this is the sort of thing that if you go to a hearing or to trial, the uh, opposing attorney is going to ask because they're going to look for a way to say, how else could this have been caused? What might be other possibilities that shift, that take blame off um, my client, the officer? And um, I, I had a lot of experience through litigation investigation, and I think we got to sit in on a lot of court cases that I participated in and just see how the intense level of scrutiny uh, the adverse attorney would place on all the evidence. So a good investigator is going to try and anticipate those things, particularly if a case is going to be sustained to ensure that um, there won't be unanswered questions that will come up later on that might uh, compromise the, the validity of a finding. Uh, so let's talk about some of the potential allegations. We did a little, little bit um, about the officer ordering uh, the complaint to remove his hat. Um, some other things you can think of that we mentioned the profanity, the threat, any other things the officer said or did that you think might be a violation of a uh, department policy? The injury to the gentleman's shoulder or arm. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. We talked about use of the taser, um, the injuries to the head. Um, one, one thing that came up for me is what the policy is when the person is initially injured, what should be the response when there's an injury? It seems like there were successive injuries mm -hmm. and the, what the responsibility of the officers is to address that. I, I'm not sure if it's that clear, but um, yeah. Yeah, typically if they're making an arrest until they have someone handcuffed, they really can't address injuries. Um, I mean, in fact, we'll see sadly in some officer involved shootings where they will actually go and handcuff the individual before they render first aid. Um, it, it's how they're trained and you know, 
the appropriateness of that in the shooting case is, is debatable, but it is typically how they are trained that they need to contain a potential threat, particularly if someone has been resisting. But they are typically required, if there is an injury, to immediately summon medical care. It appears they did, an ambulance was summoned, it responded to the theater. Obviously, you want to look at how promptly they summoned um, the ambulance and what they reported. Uh, and again, that would be in the CAD record and also in the communications audio, what they're saying about the nature of the injury, which will ref reflect how quickly they want the ambulance to respond. If it's, you know, do they want it to come code three? Is the person bleeding profusely? Um, or is it an injury that, uh, you know, if they get here, uh, not with red lights and siren, but, you know, in, in an appropriate period of time. <clears throat> um, Another possible allegation would be the officer telling, Officer Rice telling the complaint to show her some respect. Um, that would not be appropriate. And that would also be an issue of, are these police actions being taken because the complaint of the complainant's attitude? It's called um, contempt of cop. Someone mouths off to a police officer, is discourteous, and the officer, instead of behaving professionally, uh, decides I'm going to teach this person a lesson and show them who's in charge here and decides to cite them or arrest them or use force. It's inappropriate. It's not professional. And uh, that should be a separate allegation. Um, so I think we've talked about um, really all the allegations I can think of. Any, any others you uh, come to mind any questions before we move on for me there's this notion of what was their end game in going in there right so mm -hmm. if these folks are just offering to be quiet isn't that really the ultimate goal here of this interaction just mm -hmm. or is it to just take action against them physical action so i don't know how to embrace that notion but mm -hmm. really you know what's a reasonable reasonable expectation going into that as to what should how it should resolve because it should, you could look at that and say it should have stopped right there. Right. And, and again, this would go to their, in, their interaction with the theater manager. Right. Um, and they should have asked, what would you like us to do with the theater manager should have articulated that and say, I'd like you to remove them from the theater, which they have a right to do. A any property owner has a right to say, I do not want this person on my property. Um, and maybe they might need to refund their tickets, but they, uh, a, pro a business owner does have that right. Um, so, but if, if, the, if he simply said, go talk to them or did not give them any instructions and they're making that decision, then you need to ask, what's the justification for that decision? And what law or rule is it based on? And the officer would have to articulate that. And if they couldn't articulate that, then that would be, uh, it could be couched as issuing an invalid order, telling them they had to leave when there was no just legal justification for that. Um, that would be similar to someone is filming on the sidewalk and the officer says, you have to leave. That's an invalid order. They're not posing a threat to the officer. They're exercising First Amendment rights to observe and possibly film. So the supervisor, so their conversation with the su the um, owner of the theater should have been part of the officer's report. Uh, yes, absolutely, absolutely. And uh, the theater. Well, we'll get to that in the investigation plan because we're going to go through some of the documents you're going to obtain. Is that is that an, an, another slide, Cami? Or are we still on this one? Oh, okay. We, we, ha we had some of these on slides that we talked about. Um, can I ask about, th this one is interesting to me, department rules on summoning backup. Uh, mm -hmm. I didn't uh, know there would be rules on that. Uh, can you just give me an example of what a rule might be with re that regard? Well, it would, it would be training. You don't want to summon backup if it's not necessary. Mm -hmm. um, if they are able to restrain the individual and they don't, the threat has passed, um, they may not need backup. Or typically, once that threat is passed, they will, they will advise the communications operator that everything is under control. They don't need backup. 
um, you know, just as important as so many other officers letting other officers know it's okay, things are under control. Um, often when you walk down the street and you see a police car with its red lights and siren, it may be responding because other officers have called uh, whatever the code is, officer needs assistance, has a resisting suspect, so they're going to get there as fast as they can. But once that officer in need no longer needs officers, they're obligated to get on the radio and say, okay, whatever the code is, uh, we don't need you. Because those officers may be coming from other duties uh, from their own sectors. So, you know, again, it would be breaking down the incident uh, step by step, what happened once he's handcuffed, um, that need really is, is, is gone away. Why don't we go to the next slide? And here are just some of the factual questions. I think we, we covered all of these. And the next slide after that. <clears throat> okay, so now we're going to talk about the investigation plan. So this is something I prepared, and all the investigators I know prepared for every investigation, no matter how minor. Um, it's a roadmap. It's a documentation of what, uh, what's, what the investigation is going to need to do. And it's something that a supervisor will review and approve. Um, it should contain timelines. It uh, enables someone else to pick up this case and see where it is at various stages and, all, and continue with the investigation if the original investigator has to go on vacation or is otherwise unavailable. So we're going to go through some of the documents to obtain. So I think that's, so I mentioned police communication records. Um, <clears throat> and this would be for both officers Peters and Rice and the officers who responded as backup. Um, written statements. We had, um, I believe, Officer um, <clears throat> Peter's statement. Um, Officer Rice also should have prepared a statement. The officers who responded as backup may have prepared individual statements. So those are all things we want to gather. Um, for many departments, anytime there's a use of force, that has to be documented, excuse me, sometimes it's in a separate use of force report or sometimes it's going to be in the original incident report. Um, for many departments, a use of force that results in an injury, which, uh, which is the case here, a sergeant would have to respond and do a preliminary use of force investigation, which would mean taking photographs of injuries getting statements from individuals that might include members of the audience, the complainants, friends, and the officers there. So that would be a separate document. Um, the names and contact information for audience members, which could be in the original incident report or in the use of force report. Um, the ambulance dispatch and incident records. The paramedics typically will prepare a report. And again, this is considered a medical record. So you need to have a HIPAA release signed, but there will also be the dispatch record indicating what information they received as they responded in terms of what kind of call they were going to, what type of injuries, uh, how, when they arrived, when they departed from the scene, when they arrived at the medical facility, and when they indicated that they were back in service. Um, you know, those, those records kind of form the framework for the incident, for understanding the times, the locations, the parties that were involved. And again, you have to ensure that the documents are reliable. You don't want to just assume it's, it is. Um, you want to determine where it came from and is it authentic. Um, the complaints, medical records, as I mentioned, so uh, jail medical records, if he saw treatment in a hospital, um, for any subsequent medical treatment he received. I have taken medical records to an expert, sometimes to an emergency room physician, sometimes to the medical examiner, and asked them, based on these photographs, on these records, what can you tell me about the likely cause of this injury? And I might say it would be consistent with or inconsistent with 
So in this case, I want to know, could this be consistent with the individual falling? Uh, and they might say, no, it's not consistent with that. Well, would it be consistent with an individual twisting this person's arm? And they might say, yes, it would be consistent with that. So that would be very important evidence reflecting on the officer's statement about how the injury was sustained. And that could even bring in possible allegations of uh, dishonesty, of falsification of a report, or possible criminal charges, um, both for infliction of the injury and for the falsification of a police report, which in many jurisdictions are uh, signed under penalty of perjury. Um, the citations prepared by the officer for the offense, um, prisoner transfer records, if he is transferred from one location to another with other individuals, he may make contemporaneous statements to those people about what happened. Uh, that can be very important. The booking documents, which will may reflect his physical condition, may include photographs, uh, same, along with the mugshot. Many jails take a photograph of someone separate from the mugshot that will often be in the file and uh, on their wristband so they can be properly identified within the jail. Uh, can we go to the next slide? So um, photographs of the officer's injuries. Now, if there's a use of force investigation, this should take place. If the officers are documenting their injuries because they're charging the man with assault, that's going to be important evidence. Um, the officer's training records Typically, officers receive refresher training periodically, maybe every year or two years, and that will often include um, use of force training. So you can find how, how recently they have received that training, really training on use of taser, um, because uh, when you interview an officer, you want to say, and when were you recently trained on this, and what was that training? And if that training occurred not that long before the incident, uh, you can ask, well, do you remember that training? And what did that training say about X behavior or Y behavior? And at some point in the interview, you can ask, was your behavior consistent with your training? And if they say no, you have to, well, why not? And they're going to have to be able to give an explanation for that. Um, the dispatch records of police responses to that theater in San Francisco, we could enter in an address and bring up records of all police responses to that address for a given period of time. So again, we could see our police frequently responding to that theater, and that could also lead us to records of the disposition of those responses. Did they eject other individuals? Did they arrest them? Did they arrest anyone for wearing a hat in the theater? Um, just, you know, the whole range of um, previous, uh, previous incidents there. Um, similarly, in San Francisco, we could enter in an address and locate all the police reports involving that particular location. Um, it might also be possible to gather records regarding all the arrests for that particular offense of wearing a hat in a the theater, either through the police agency, possibly through the county prosecutor or the city prosecutor. And if the district attorney says, I've been doing this job for 20 years and I've never heard of anyone being charged with that offense. I'm surprised it's still on the books. That's going to be a powerful statement about um, the charging of uh, the complaint with that offense. Um, and also the records of arrest by those officers for assault on an officer or resisting arrest and how that might compare to similarly situated officers. Are they charging people with resisting more frequently? And that can be an indicator that officers are using force more often because they're charging people with resisting. Um, go to the next slide, please. A a any questions about those records? So physical evidence, um, we talked about photographs of the complainant's injuries. If he comes in to make that complaint and those within a period of time when he still has uh, visible injuries or when they should be seen, those injuries should be photographed. They should be photographed with proper lighting, with a scale in the photograph. Um, the, because that's gonna be evidence you may wanna to take to a medical professional. That's gonna be very important evidence um, 
if there's a sustained finding, the body-worn camera recordings, and these are going to be one of the first things the investigator should get. The, you know, they, some agencies have immediate access to them. Um, they can just go into the database and pull that up. And if those cameras were running, they're going to give you a good visual sense, but also an audio recording of what happened. So right away, you're going to know, did that officer use profanity? What was the verbal interchange there? It may very immediately confirm or refute some of the complaint and statements and may indicate um, the officer's report is largely seems to be correct or may indicate the officer's report is absolutely incorrect. Maybe we need to refer this for a criminal investigation because it clearly shows officers using force um, that is not described in that report. Um, the photographs of the clothing worn by the complainant at the time of the arrest, uh, this can be useful. The clothing may show scuff marks, it may show damage, tears, but also it may be useful when you talk to witnesses, and again, if this was a big theater, um, if you can know what the individual is wearing, you can say, did you observe that person? Um, someone might have been in, it might be a multiplex, and they may have seen officers leading someone away and they say, I remember he was wearing this and this. Um, then you know that's the complaint. It's a way of um, you know, confirming identification. Those cell phone videos, uh, from audience members um, and the batons and flashlights if they were used to strike complaint in the head. Um, the an officer saying he sustained the injuries one way, he's saying he sustained them from being struck in the head with a baton or a flashlight. Um, in that case, you might want to seize that baton or flashlight and potentially have it tested for DNA evidence, because again, we're talking about a potentially serious criminal offense. If an officer lies in a police report about how officers said someone sustained injuries and actually struck them in the head with a flashlight, um, that's gonna be a serious act of misconduct. And then I mentioned some photographs of the theater to get an idea of the sight lines, the size, um, and kind of the perspective. Uh, any questions about, about um, the physical evidence listed here? Okay, let's go on to some of the witnesses. So obviously the complainant's two companions, they should have, we would hope, a lot to say. Um, you wanna interview them separately. You wanna ask them, clarify what they individually observed versus what they may have uh, heard from the other. They may have compared stories and that's, uh, you know, People are allowed to do that. We try and prevent it um, if we can control it, but uh, you just want to find out how one individual's perspective might have affected the other's perspective. Um, the theater employee who had contact with complainants and his companions, um, members of the audience, potentially the projectionist who might have had an opportunity to hear or see what was taking place. I mentioned the paramedics um, medical personnel who examined and treated the complainant. Uh, again, what, what did he say to them about what had happened? Um, again, those contemporaneous statements. Uh, I did EO investigations for a time. Those often involve a situation where it's one-on-one -on -one about um, sexual propositions or sexual statements. And in those cases, contemporaneous statements made by the victim are very powerful. Someone calls a friend in tears saying, you know, my boss just said this to me or a coworker said this, I don't know what to do. Uh, those can confirm their account. They can uh, buttress their credibility. So I always look for those. And the same would apply for jail personnel who took custody of the complainant. Um, also show, you know, talk about his demeanor. The officers are describing him as very angry and threatening and aggressive. Well, if everyone else says he was docile, that's going to kind of contradict that. Um, so the next slide. Um, other investigation might be social media sites. The people who took those videos may have posted them to Facebook, to YouTube, to TikTok, uh, to whatever. So you'd want to look at those. 
um, you might want to see if anyone had post made postings about those officers because of their previous encounters. And potentially, you might want to look at postings by those officers. You've probably read about um, certain Facebook pages or uh, uh, websites where current and retired officers talk about their experiences, about their opinions. Uh, some agencies have done investigations because they found that officers have been posting things that uh, reflect discredit on the department, sometimes um, uh, racially or ethnically biased statements uh, indicating a, a prejudice. Uh, so that's an increasing area for potential investigation. I haven't done any of those, but uh, it's something that's out there. And um, we may see more uh, many police agencies are now adopting pol social media policies for their employees regarding what is permissible for them to post um, about their work, particularly if it identifies them as an officer. And then also YouTube postings of, of the videos. Any questions about that? So I always like to premiere when there are multiple witnesses or issues, I like to prepare a matrix. And if this is hard to read, Cami's gonna send you the PowerPoint so you can look at it more easily. But this kind of charts out a comparison after the investigation of what the party said about some of these significant issues here. Um, like, you know, whether the complainant is friends yelling, um, the uh, officer statements about wearing hats, uh, whether the complainant punched or kicked the officers, uh, the cause of the complaint, the injuries to the complainant's head. Um, so this forms a good basis for how you're going to outline and then write the report. It shows you what the evidence is and kind of it's kind of it gives you a very good visual aid. So I, I, I have trained people to use this. I don't know whether officers in Burlington PD who do internal affairs investigations use these, but it's a, it's a nice graphic, uh, graphic representation. Any, any questions about this? So let's move on to what you might look for when you're reviewing an investigation. So we have the first slide. So um, first is the complaint and interview. And um, was the complaint allowed to tell their story with minimal interruption? Um, was all relevant information obtained? So this would include things like contact information for witnesses. Um, for the Johnson complaint, how can I contact your friends? What are their addresses, phone numbers, emails? Uh, where am I likely to find? Did you know anyone in the audience? You want to get as much information as you can so you can make direct contact with those, in, those individuals. You don't want to say, oh, well, ask them, here's my card, ask them to give me a call. Now, that's a passive approach. You want an active approach to say, how can I contact them very directly? Um, you want to get a description of each officer and their actions and like may not know the officer's name. Sometimes you'll say officer one, officer two, or you know, the, the tall officer, or the officer with a blonde hair, or the officer who was bald, or whatever. Um, documentation of everything that happened in the incident, of the injuries, um, their awareness of any recordings. You know, was there anyone around there? Did anyone have their phone up? Are you familiar with that area? Are there any CCTV cameras there? Um, uh, were they, if they had injuries, were they asked to sign a medical release? Uh, were they asked appropriate closing questions? When those would include, have you discussed this with anyone? Um, and who, when, what was the summary of that discussion? Because again, those contemporaneous statements can be important. But also, if they gave an account of this to someone else that's very different from what they're telling the investigator, that's also going to be significant. Um, is there anything we haven't discussed you think I should know? Any question you think I should have asked? Again, if you remember something, will you let me know? Um, next slide. Could I uh, jump oh, yeah. in with a question? So from our perspective, so this now 
causes me to ask questions about our role as commissioners in reviewing uh, investigations of complaints. So that last slide, I'm sorry, uh, complaint and interview, right? Um, how would we know if all of this had been done? Would we be, how would we be able to ascertain the quality of the complaint and interview? Um, would it be, you know, that the chief or the investigator would write a written report. How do we know, for example, the complaint whether the complaint was allowed to tell his or her story? Well, I actually looked at your um, the rules of the your commission in reviewing complaints, and I think it says each commissioner shall have access to the written records of all complaints upon request of the chief, um, includes identification of all witnesses, documents, evidence, or other information obtained or consulted in the course of the investigation. So I'm not sure how your department, how your city attorney is applying that, um, but I would see that for you saying, we'd like to see the transcripts of the interviews, the summaries of the interviews, um, audio recordings. Many, most agencies now are moving towards transcribing interviews because it can be fairly inexpensive. There's a service that, um, the agency I most recently worked for used rev.com. Um, it was really fairly cost efficient and, and certainly more cost effective than having the investigator listen to the recording and summarizing it. It really also gave you a permanent record um, so a reviewer could see that. Um, so that would allow you to see that. Um, so again, I, I don't know what you're going to be able to access, but I would try and interpret that as broadly uh, as you can get as much as you can. Um, and uh, one thing I was thinking about, your chief or the Internal Affairs Bureau may say, um, uh, we know our job, uh, you know, you're really not going to aid us. And a response to that can be, I know you, it's a small department, I think it's budgeted for 105 officers and currently have 70 or 80 members of the commission are being exposed to a lot of information those internal affairs investigators probably aren't, like this training, other resources in the oversight community. So you're learning a lot about how it, effective practices for administrative investigations. So officers in internal affairs typically are there for a limited tenure, and then they're gonna go out to other assignments. They're typically at least drank a sergeant, meaning they probably have aspirations to rise up in the department or to be work as detectives. Well, if you're going to be a supervisor or a manager investigating complaints against employees, conducting administrative investigations is a really important skill. And you can help them um, become more skilled to that, give them more hours in their quiver, which is going to aid them on promotional examinations, aid them as they rise through the ranks. Uh, they may seek management positions in different police agencies, maybe smaller agencies. So this is going to be a boon to their career, to their the trajectory of their career, because you're going to have something to offer them that some training, some insight that they may not have. And it's also going to ensure that their investigations are more solid, which is going to reflect on their performance. If their investigations um, go to arbitration, and I don't know if that happens when an officer is disciplined, and the arbitrator says, this is a very solid investigation, very well done. It supports the finding, and I'm going to support the department's uh, decision in this matter. That's going to you know, bolster their reputation. That's going to be something that will enhance their, their performance and um, their career path. So that's something you can you know, offer them. Um, Jason, it's yes. in a review capacity, is that, I guess our document is gonna guide whether we could say when presented with the, the summary of the investigation, if the complainant was never interviewed, for example, and, and it's presented to us the completed investigation, I guess we are gonna have to put you know, this is where we would think about an MOU that would say the commission could ask for, you know, upon completion, they could say, well, actually, we would like these additional things done. Like, we'd like to have the complainant interviewed, mm -hmm. whatever it is. That would be appropriate. Yes, okay. yes. complainant should be interviewed, uh, I think, almost all the time, unless um, they have 
choose not to, and they have a, provided a very detailed statement or unless they're represented by an attorney who is declining to make them available for an interview. And I, I, I suppose there could be complainants who might uh, feel like it's traumatic to be interviewed, perhaps, you know, even though they're willing to do the complaint, they might feel like being interviewed by the police is just um, mm -hmm. adding to it. And that is, um, that's a very good point. And that's why in some cities that review investigations rather than having that independent investigatory authority, they also have the ability to take complaints so that there is a non-law -law enforcement entity that can take the complaint. And some of them do the initial interview with the complainant um, so that they, there's not that um, same fear necessarily if they are afraid or, or they're reliving a trauma. Um, it might be easier if they're doing that with someone who's not in sworn law enforcement. So something to consider. Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay. So, um, Yeah, yeah, so investigator assignment. So is the investigator free of potential bias? This would mean, do they have any involvement in the incident? Uh, do they respond to that scene? Do they have a relationship with an involved party that could be perceived as compromising the investigation? And I say, could be perceived. Doesn't mean there is a real bias, but perception is very important. So this could be a family relationship personal friendship, romantic relationship, outside business relationship. Like I mentioned, does the officer have secondary employment working at that business, doing security on weekends? Uh, you may remember Derek Chauvin uh, worked security for a nightclub. Um, so he might have had a relationship with that business. Um, close work relationship. And again, you have a small department. Uh, if someone really shouldn't be investigating someone who used to be their partner uh, or someone who they work closely with or might be working closely with in the future. Um, if, I, if I may, that, that was uh, what I was gonna ask about because it is a small department, it's a small town. Uh, that issue seems especially important here. And um, I just wanted to note your comment that some agencies require that the investigators sign a document that says there is no conflict of interest. Is that something you think is uh, especially advisable in a small department, for example? Well, that's from the Oakland Police Department, which has about 900 officers. So it has a fairly large internal affairs unit. Mm -hmm. So if one individual has a conflict, it can easily be assigned to another internal affairs investigator. But um, as I mentioned, I did EO investigations for a public agency and I was the only EO investigator there. So we had a procedure where if an investigator involved someone I had a personal relationship with, we were gonna hire an outside investigator. Or if it involved someone in the human resources department, which I was a part of, we were gonna bring in an outside investigator. And I know that's something that came up during your last session with Cami, and I, I have done a little research on that. I hope to do more. Um, but uh, I found two jurisdictions in California that have contracted with outside investigators and they have paid in the area of around $90 an hour. Now that's based on California cost of living. And in one of those jurisdictions, um, the court appointed rate that's paid by the county for court appointed investigators where the public defender's office has a conflict, they can't represent someone. So you have a conflict attorney and they hire an investigator, a private investigator outside the public defender's office who's doing the same type of investigation. And in that county, they typically pay 75 to $100 an hour for court appointed investigators. So to gauge what it might be there, uh, you could try contacting your county public defender office, finding out is there a court appointed program and what is the court appointed investigator rate, both for the county and in federal court, whatever federal district there. And that might give you a sense of what an appropriate rate would be. Um, 
So uh, did the investigator have adequate time and resources to conduct the investigation? So this would reflect, was their caseload too onerous that they could not get to it in time? Were they given this case two days before they're going on a three week investigation, which means nothing's going to happen for three weeks? Did they have the equipment they need? Uh, were there no cars for them to go out in the field with, to go knock on witnesses' doors? Did they not have a camera to go out and take photographs? Um, those are all relevant, relevant factors ensuring that the, the investigation is uh, robust and uh, effective. So can we... And the, so the investigation plan. Um, well, the relevant rules, allegations raised, and the rules adhered to. Uh, so this would mean the allegations raised by the complainant, uh, additional allegations or violations not raised by the complaint, but that the investigator should be able to identify. I believe that when you're doing a, an administrative investigation, it should be behavior driven and not complaint driven. It's to the benefit of that agency to identify rules violations and problem officers to avoid problems in the future and not just look at only those things that a, some, an individual complains about. So some agencies, if a complaint withdraws the complaint, will stop the investigation. I disagree with that. I think if, that, if there's misconduct there, the agency needs to know about that. And again, I bring in some of my EEO perspective to this, where the law requires that if an employer becomes aware of harassing or discriminatory behavior, they are legally obligated to investigate it, whether or not the complainant wants to proceed. If they fail to do an adequate investigation, they can be liable down the road. And I think that should apply, that same standard should apply to police agencies because the hazard posed by officers who violate the rules can be um, enormous to the community and to the police agency. Um, so, um, we're all supervisory officers held accountable and we're all relevant policies and rules identified. And that can be very important because often an officer needs to be noticed before the interview of the rules they might be held accountable to. And if that's not done, then they can't be held um, to, to have violated them if they don't receive that notice. I don't know what the requirements are in, for Burlington Police Department. Um, so did the plan identify the relevant records, evidence, witnesses, investigative tasks? Did it include a timeline? To, and did a supervisor ensure that that timeline was adhered to? And if not, why not? Um, was it reviewed by a supervisor? Um, were the tasks performed in a timely manner? Um, were failures to obtain documents, evidence, or conduct interviews explained? Was it because someone was unavailable, because no efforts were made um, be, for, for some other reason? But you know, lack of documentation just al allows someone to guess. Um, and were any gaps in the investigation because of you know, the officer was, the investigator was involved with something else, or there had to be a halt for some reason, maybe there was a court proceeding going on where those explained and documented. <clears throat> so can the next slide, please. Could, could I, I'm sorry, could I just ask a question? So when you say did the supervisor review the plan? So uh, in, our, in our role as commissioners, uh, we could then ask to see the investigation plan. Who, who is typically, uh, I know in larger agencies it's probably different, but who would be the relevant supervisor of a person who's doing an investigation, would that be the chief? And typically in an internal affairs unit, it would be a lieutenant or a captain, or for Burlington PD, it might be the deputy chief for administration if it's under their aegis and the internal investigations take place. I think typically the chief is not gonna receive the complaint until the report is concluded. They don't wanna have a direct hand in it because they don't wanna be any perception of them influencing it because they're gonna make the ultimate decision on any discipline. I see. They wanna be one step removed, so. Lieutenant, Captain, or Deputy Chief should be reviewing that plan, approving it, making sure it's adhered to um, yeah, as it progresses. Thanks. Um, so the next slide. 
regarding records. So it's often helpful for officers to have investigators to have a checklist of all the potential records and to document, you know, the date of they were requested, date they were received, that goes in the file, very graphically illustrates when they requested, when they, when they came in. Um, there's a whole list of potential records and Cameron's gonna send you this document in another form, so you'll have them. I don't need to review them here. Um, uh, can we go to the next slide for interviews? So were the interviews recorded and were those recordings transcribed? Uh, typically in California, all piece, uh, interviews with all law enforcement officers have to be audio recorded. They don't have a right to refuse. So it was our practice to audio record everyone unless they refused. Um, when I was doing EO investigations, if the party refused to be interviewed, we had a second person in the room who served solely as a note taker. Um, so we would want it, it's uh, useful to have a second person so you can have some corroboration of what someone something was said if you just have to rely on written notes. Um, for civilian witnesses, um, as I mentioned, was due diligence exercise to locate necessary witnesses. Um, and some of the things that can be checked for that due diligence will be in the document Cami will send you. Was a canvas for witnesses conducted? Um, was it done in a timely manner? Was it properly documented? Um, were the interviews thorough? Were they, uh, was a complete narrative elicited with questions asked in a neutral manner with open-ended and clarifying questions? Was all relevant information obtained and were inconsistencies addressed? Um, for officer interviews, were they conducted in conformance with officers' rights and responsibilities? Were they asked about their training and experience? Were they asked about their understanding of relevant policies and rules? Were there no suggestive or leading questions? They, were they asked to describe actions very specifically? And were inconsistencies addressed? Um, and then the next, any questions about that? Go to the next slide. And the report. So was all the relevant evidence summarized? Were all the allegations addressed? Were relevant policies and rules cited? Um, did the investigator gather all the evidence that was really necessary to reach a finding? Um, did the investigator make credibility assessments? Uh, was the basis for credibility assessments clearly stated in the report? Were the reasons for the credibility assessments based on evidence, not based on purely subjective factors? I didn't like the way he looked. I don't trust people like X. Um, and again, they're very established credibility factors. Um, uh, were the credibility assessments, uh, credibility assessments consistently applied to civilian witnesses and to officers? Officers should not necessarily believe, be believed more solely because they are officers, but were they can, credible because um, of the credibility factors? Were their statements consistent with other evidence, with other witnesses? Were they plausible, et cetera? Um, did the investigator analyze all the evidence and testimony? Did they address and reconcile inconsistencies in the evidence? Uh, did the evidence support the findings? And was the preponderance the evidence standard of proof applied? I'm assuming that's the standard for your agency, that it's not clear and convincing. Preponderance of evidence means more likely than not. And one of my agency directors described that as, you have a scale, it's evenly balanced, and you put a feather on one side. Um, and that's the preponderance. Um, Can I ask, is there a policy about this? You just asked if our agency has that particular rule. Uh, how would we find that out? Where would that? I didn't, I didn't see it in the policy regarding internal affairs investigations, but that's something the chief of police of the city attorney should know. Uh, it should be memorialized somewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, it is in, in workplace investigations nationwide, the standard is generally preponderance of the evidence and investigation of complaints against police officers is a type of workplace investigation. So that should be the appropriate standard. If it's not, then someone should look at that and 
the department should explain why they want a higher standard. And Stephanie, I imagine we need to look at the CBA on this as well. Uh, uh huh. Right. Right. Yep. That's another thing um, internal affairs investigators can gain from doing administrative investigations. They're used to dealing with uh, proof beyond the reasonable doubt, which was a much higher standard. But the preponderance standards, the standard they will have to use if they go on to be managers, if they go on to be a, a captain or a chief of this department or another department, which I'm sure some of them aspire to. So they will need to be familiar with that standard and know how to apply it. So that's a skill they're going to gain and that you can help them gain it. So I did want to mention a good resource and that is this book. Um, it's called Managing Accountability Systems for Police Conduct by Jeffrey Noble. And in the back, it has appendices with 12 and 14 page outlines for all the questions you can ask a complainant and a police officer. And I'm recommending it because it is affordable as an ebook uh, on a Libris. You can get it from the publisher uh, $15 for 90 days or $30, $32 to purchase it. Um, and unfortunately, the hard copy is somewhere between $40 and $75. But can you it has some the name? Sure, um, it's Managing Accountability Systems for Police Conduct. And I'll send the information for Cami with the name of the author and the publisher so she can send that to you as well. Um, but I, I highly recommend it. It has chapters devoted to the process of investigation, to interviews, to discipline, um, uh, you know, going into more, far greater detail than I did, probably more eloquently than I, than I did. So other questions? Yeah, I do have a question. Um, you mentioned if a complainant, and I'm sorry, I'm just blurting other, <laughs> if a complainant um, says at some point in the, the investigation says, actually, I don't want to proceed. You've said, you know, you should just proceed with it. In the case that we, it's not uncommon for us to have complaints that are not brought by the individual who was involved, but by mm -hmm. someone who maybe captured footage on camera or mm -hmm. whatever. I presume the same answer is going to apply if you contact that individual and they say that they want, they don't want an investigation of what happened with them for whatever reason, that one should still proceed. Um, well, if you have a complainant who is not the victim uh, and, uh, and the victim of the subject of the police action says, I don't want to proceed, well, then you can still proceed because you have a complainant. Now, I don't know what your MOU says about whether an investigation can go forward if the complaint withdraws that. Um, you need to take a look at that. But that's, well, that's, that's easy because like we have no MOU. <laughs> it's silent. We, oh, that's something we're going to be working on, but that's helpful, actually. Yeah. You, you, may, you may encounter resistance from officers about proceeding with an investigation if the complaint withdraws it. So I'm just giving you my personal opinion about um, the focus of administrative investigations and the benefit I think they give to managers of a police agency and to a commission like yours. But that may not be applicable or feasible in your community. It, it appears that more and more um, oversight entities are gaining the ability to, to receive third party complaints. Um, that wasn't as common two decades ago, but it is more common now than it had been. Um, for that very reason, um, there are there's a lot of things that are captured on video that someone might not feel comfortable actually complaining. The other thing that has become more common is the acceptance of anonymous complaints. That someone is is for whatever reason concerned about um, whether it be for retribution. Um, there are some people who are the victims of misconduct who also might have criminal complaints against them and are concerned about how that might affect them. Um, that doesn't mean they weren't the victim of misconduct. Um, 
but th there is, a, when you accept anonymous complaints, there's a lot of work to be done to let people know what that actually does to an investigation. If you can't contact them, that you have very minimal information other than the initial interview, it does make it difficult to come to a, an accurate finding. So, but still more people are accepting them. Yeah, that's helpful. We do accept them. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. And it's some boards or commissions are now gaining the ability to ask their agency to initiate an investigation. Based it, on it will, it will address community concerns, even if there is no complaint filed. Oh. And that was something San Francisco recently gained that ability. Um, uh, and I think Oakland also has that ability that the Civilian Police Commission can ask the civilian oversight entity to conduct an investigation because it's an issue that uh, the public has concern about. And, and the, one of the reasons is I, when I served on a civilian review board, um, you would see things that happened in the community. You'd see video of them and people would say, well, why aren't you doing anything about it? Well, you have to wait for a complaint to come in for that to actually initiate the process. Um, so we are seeing more and more um, being able to, as Jason said, to initiate an investigation when they know that there has been evidence that something occurred and they want to make sure an investigation is done. Can I ask where would that agreement that the oversight board be able to request an investigation, where would that lie in terms of policy or in written form? It was an ordinance passed by the voters. It was a voter approved initiative. Oh. And uh -huh. I can get that to you. Um, and San Francisco's oversight entity three years ago through a, a similar initiative gained the authority to initiate investigations on their own. If I'm not and mistaken, the, uh, I believe, uh, sorry, I, I, know, I know we can file complaints on behalf of people. So I'm assuming that we, if, if we have any concern or complaint about something that we could make that complaint even if there's not an official complaint in. So uh, my understanding, I think it should be investigated by BPD, anything we bring up. Yeah, I had the same impression and I'll have to check our oversight policy on that because it might suggest that, but it could certainly be clearer if it doesn't. Yeah, absolutely, I agree with that. And lawsuits are sometimes referred to as a complaint with a price tag. Um, some will file a lawsuit, they will not file an official complaint, but some jurisdictions view lawsuits as a matter that should receive an administrative investigation. It's typically investigated by the city attorney or whoever is going to defend um, the municipality against that lawsuit, but their focus is uh, what is the validity of this lawsuit and what is our liability here and it's not necessary. did the officer comply with the rules and what um, potential remedial action might need to be taken. So that's also something to consider. Um, can I ask a, a couple of uh, questions? Uh, I'll just put them both out there and uh, you know you can respond to them sequentially however you'd like. So one question would be whether you have any particular advice for a small community like ours um, in terms of investigations, anything you know specific to us. Another, and a second question is, um, any thoughts or comments on complaints filed by parents uh, of events that occurred to their juvenile child? So, in other, so just the whole issue around whether the, the subject here under consideration is a juvenile, are there different issues that come up that we should be aware of? Uh, does your department have a specific policy regarding juveniles? Shannon, do you know Juvenile. that? Um, so far as what? Um, um, you know, questioning juveniles outside the presence of their parents or notification to parents when a juvenile is detained or arrested. Um, I can't speak specific, but I can certainly find out for the commission. I do want to say I believe that they do not question juveniles without their parents present. Um, 
but I, I can't say for certain. So I would say uh, parents certainly do have a right to file a complaint on behalf of their children. Uh, and obviously you would want the parents consent to interview the juvenile. And so often they, the parent will want to be present. Um, you know, there's another issue in San Francisco, we did accept complaints from juveniles uh, and they did not have to obtain their parents' consent. Uh, you know, juveniles in San Francisco often have encounters with police and we wanted them to know their rights and to understand they could come to us uh, to make a complaint. And you know, I emphasize to everyone, the fact that a complaint is accepted and that, or that an investigation is being conducted is not a judgment about behavior. It's just an investigation. It's a neutral fact-finding process. So it doesn't mean anyone has formed any judgment about um, the allegations brought forth in a complaint. And regarding the small community, um, you know, I, and I, I had asked County Earl if you knew um, whether you have a dedicated internal affairs bureau because the police department website mentions complaints referred by a, an executive investigator employing a specific individual. So I, I'm just a little unclear uh, what your, the internal affairs unit, if any, looks like, how many officers are in it and what other duties they have. I know there's a detective bureau that investigates a wide range of criminal offenses. Um, yeah, uh, there is statewide training. There's a statewide internal affairs investigation course. Um, I think it's something like 600 and some odd dollars. Um, I assume BPD has sent officers to that. Um, but it largely focuses on uh, the laws applying to internal affairs investigations, maybe somewhat on the techniques. Um, you know, as I've mentioned, uh, interviewing in administrative investigations can be very different than interviewing in criminal cases. Particularly dealing with the hurdle of a complainant feeling mistrustful of police and they're in there talking to an officer who may have a, a badge and a gun on their belt. Um, you know, you need, the officer needs to make some extra efforts to diffuse apprehension and concern and establish rapport and make that person feel comfortable. And uh, officers can be perfectly capable of that, um, but it, it may be a little different than what they're, they may be accustomed to. Particularly when you're listening to someone who may have a lot of emotion, negative emotion about the police. Um, Councillor Paul is uh, in this training and just wanted to check and see, Karen, if you had any questions. Um, well, if you do, just uh, feel free to unmute. I, I don't want to take it up anybody else's time if others want to ask questions. Um, but I, I just, like for example, the last example that you gave Jason um, with regard to the demeanor of the investigator and so forth, again, I think our challenge is as a review entity, um, I'm not sure how we assess certain things, such as that, for example. Right. Um, ideally, it would be great if you could get the audio recordings of the interviews mm -hmm. uh, to review them and get a sense of what they sound like. Mm -hmm. um, that's why I mentioned that uh, podcast, the KQED Pocket. It's really fascinating to hear the actual internal affairs in interviews done in a country where they had no idea these would ever become public. The law at the time made these absolutely confidential, but the law changed and now they're accessible. So um, it shows, you know, the good and uh, the not so good in terms of how they uh, question different parties. 
And they also have uh, the audio for body-worn camera videos of police encounters of incidents that became contentious. Um, I was just Googling that. And so if you could uh, give us some more specifics about the title of the podcast, because there are several from sure. KUED, that would be great. It's called On Our Watch. Oh, OK. And I will also send Tammy the link so she can forward that on to you. They have new episodes coming out every Thursday. So when I finish this, I'm going to go out for a bike ride and listen to it while I ride. OK, great. Yes, Shannon, did you? Just, um, I appreciate you allowing me to, to ask some questions to the chiefs who are not on the call and provide some clarifying information. So they, we do have a juvenile detective and then the Kuzi detective. So that's um, the Chittenden unit, special investigation unit. Um, detectives have extensive training in intervi interviewing juveniles. And traditionally that unit is the one that would do the juvenile inter interviews. And then regarding um, the internals, we do not have an internal investigative unit. Um, we, we just are not large enough for that. So the lieutenants are the ones that conduct um, the internal investigations. And then the deputy chiefs, uh, the deputy chiefs and the chiefs will review those interviews and that investigation. Okay. So it may be a somewhat somewhat new endeavor for those lieutenants you know, because people stay lieutenant for a limited period of time um they hope to move up but um it's uh new skills they can acquire and refine and as i said you're being exposed to information uh lieutenants given their many other tasks may not have an opportunity to be exposed to so you can give them useful information that will help them do their jobs better now and, and in the future, you know, because lieutenants said are, are likely to rise up in this or another agency and wind up being managers who may have to review uh, administrative investigations and make decisions about them. So does anyone, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Stephanie. I, 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 again, I, I, if, I, if uh, others, want to ask questions. I don't want to take up their time. Um, I don't know if Jabu or Shireen has other questions. Mine is more about the feedback that the oversight entity would provide in response to the department's report to us about the investigation, the kinds of feedback that we would give. I have a sense of that. Um, and for example, I understand we could ask questions about um, whether certain things have been done, certain materials, interviews, and so on and so forth. I just wonder if you have any other advice with regard to what feedback we would provide given our role. Do you want me to jump in there, Jason? Yeah, I'm, I'm, as I said, I've looked over your rules and I'm, I'm not sure in, in uh, you know, practical basis what you are allowed to provide. Um, and Cammy actually has more experience dealing with different boards and commissions than I do because she's dealt with them all around the country. So since what governs you now is fairly broad and in some cases vague, um, I know that we talked previously about MOUs and a lot of that original conversation, I think kind of centered around the exchange of information. And I think that you can look at that as a way to not only what information can you get, but it also can be what information you'd like to, it, what is the two way street um, that you'd like to create and then, it, and kind of solidify a process. So um, sometimes that looks like for agencies that they might review a, an investigation and there are certain things that they see that they see as potential deficiencies in the investigation. And it could just be that you see that, why wasn't this interview or this in, um, witness in, interviewed? And there could be a very logical reason for that, but it's just not in the file. And so there's a list of questions that can be sent back and responses that are given to you. Um, some in, uh, 
oversight authorities or entities have the ability to request additional investigation. Um, sometimes they can look at an investigation and not agree with the disposition of it. They might say, well, I'm looking at this and this doesn't feel unfounded to me, or this doesn't feel sustained to me. Um, and so that they can have that conversation, whether it is um, in many instances, kind of when there's information that seems to be lacking, that might be a conversation with the lieutenant who did the investigation. If there is additional concern or a disagreement about disposition, then that might be a conversation with the chief. It just really depends on the process that's set up in the specific jurisdiction. And so I think that um, as you kind of work on it, an MOU, that, that you also think about um, that two-way street. And one thing that I, that isn't necessarily just tied to this, but I think is really important to think about is also time frame. That when you have an investigation in front of you to review, that that review should be done in a certain amount of time. But also that when you send a request for information, that the response to that request should be addressed in a certain amount of time. So also make sure as you're kind of thinking about how you want this to be, um, the process to be memorialized, um, that you're also thinking about those things. Because first of all, if you have a complainant, you don't want their investigation to sit there and not be addressed. If you have an officer, particularly if it is a valid complaint, if you have at the same, on the same level, if you have an officer who has an alleged complaint against them and you don't want them to have to have that hanging over their head for a period of time. Whether it's founded, unfounded, it doesn't matter. It, there just should be a process. I was sitting in a training with the city last night where the head of their um, professional standards bureau um, was kind of explaining the process. And he said that you know, some investigations can take up to a year. It really just depends on how complex they are. Um, now, Normally complainants and officers really don't want them to take that long. So there's, then you put into place that we expect them to take this long unless there are issues that um, are put down in writing and explain why it's taking longer than the time frame allotted. So that you kind of give some wiggle room if there are circumstances that prevent something to be done in 90 days or 120 days. Um, or in some cases, 45 days in some cities, um, but that also allow kind of that wiggle room if it can't be done. I have a quick question and I just wanna make clear it's not related to anything currently going on in Burlington, but just a general question. Um, what if there's a complaint against the chief uh, and um, would you have, a, I guess in those cases, you would have an outside entity do the investigation. It wouldn't be internal, okay. Right. Yes, and that has caused some <laughs> serious friction in some cities um, because I think what happens is there's normally not something in place, particularly when you have an oversight entity in a jurisdiction, there, there should be some kind of, if it's, uh, if it's a, for a complaint against the chief, then it goes over here. If it's a complaint against anybody else, it goes over here. And a lot of people, I, I think, just don't really think about how that's gonna happen. It's not laid out anywhere. I think there's a, probably a process everybody's thought about. Um, and in some cities, a civilian oversight entity does have the ability to investigate. Um, Denver is one of them. They didn't used to have that, um, that ability and that's uh, that became, um, a change in actually eventually in the charter, I believe, um, to say that they could investigate um, the chief. But in a lot of instances, it's particularly, I would say probably in a small, smaller um, jurisdiction that that probably is an outside entity that there's, there's probably way too many conflicts involved. Thanks. I would also say in regard to the materials you they provide you, I don't know how much training they've given you about 
the types of documents generated, but it's a really excellent opportunity to learn about the types of records and say, you know, this will help us understand um, your procedures and what police officers have to do. I don't know if you've uh, talked about ride-alongs. Um, when I first started in this field, I did frequent ride-alongs. And every time an officer took out any type of piece of paper, I'd say, what is that? And can I have a blank <laughs> copy of that? And this is before computerization, a lot of things. And I'd write on the back what it was. Um, and in my old agency, we actually had a, a loose leaf binder of all the forms. So you would know, you could look up which one was, what it was called, uh, get a sense of what it did. So the document academy is going to send you a list of different types of forms. Some may be applicable to BPD, but some may not. Uh, you, BPD may have some forms that aren't on there because they're specific to uh, its its procedures. But it's good to know what's there and you know give an idea of what should be in in the file. Jason, I snickered because I just had this picture of the officer saying, oh, here's Jason, <laughs> the investigator getting in the car with me on the ride along. <laughs> you know, actually, it went very well because <laughs> the agency had been established and I actually asked to speak to the lineup at the start of the shift and say, look, you may not be happy that we're here, but we are here and I want to do my job as well as I can. I haven't been a police officer, but I'm here to learn as much as I can within the bounds of safety by experiencing what you experience. I'm not here to catch anyone doing anything or judge anyone. And uh, that impressed them that at least I was really open. I said, please help me understand the challenges you face. And police officers given the opportunity, will we'll like to talk about what they encounter. Uh, and that went a long way towards gaining some credibility. Uh, I mean, as you said, you know, before you get in the car, you're the big bad wolf. But once, they, once you sit with them and talk with them for a while and say, oh, I didn't know that. And I really appreciate you telling me that or showing me how that works. Um, they humanize you. You become humanized and they show you're interested and you want to do the job professionally. And um, uh, you can gain a lot from that. So. I just so, point out one more. Okay. Uh, did Shannon, did you have a, qu a qu comment? I was just going to say that the chief did actually um, talk to the OIC executive assistant today about trying to open ride alongs again and think about what that looks like. Okay. So hopefully that will be here shortly. Okay. We do have a couple of members from the public that have been calling quite frequently requesting. So we have a callback list, but. Mm -hmm. I see you also have a Citizens Police Academy. We do, we do. We didn't get to, um, we tried to do a virtual this year and we didn't really have many signups. I think it was just a, obviously a really rough year, but we are hoping to be able to, that starts in January, I believe. So we are hoping to be able to do that again. Usually they do have quite a good turnout. Um, bless you, Stephanie. And I don't know if you have a budget, but uh, we were able to attend um, classes put on by post peace officer standards and training and I think there's something analogous in Vermont oh wow uh, that you might be able to attend I don't know if they're doing any of their trainings virtually or if the city would pay for that or if they might waive the fees but I found those very useful to always learn what officers learn what they are taught yeah, definitely. and also get a sense of what the culture is like there uh Um, I, I maybe I think we probably should wrap this up. It, we're a little bit over, and uh, don't want to impose too much on Jason and Cami. Yeah, um, I don't have any questions, but I I can't express enough how helpful this this session was. Um, yeah, I honestly can't like this. This was extremely helpful, and thank you so much for um, being here with us and helping us out with this because. Yeah, this is honestly has, has been invaluable. Oh, well, thank you. As I said, I know you are taking time away from your families and other things to do this and everything else you do as commissioners. So I applaud that and, and thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Um, 
Well, seeing how we don't have a quorum, um, uh, I think the meeting just ends. So <laughs> uh, thank you for everybody in the public that, um, that signed in for this. Um, I believe this will be posted to a YouTube channel um, within the next couple of days. So anyone, uh, anyone can um, replay the, the recorded part of this video in the future. And um, I believe the next, se uh, the next training session is Tuesday the 15th. Um, and public forum will start uh, at 5.30 and uh, the training from six to eight. Um, so thank you everybody in the public that uh, signed in with us. Um, have a good rest of your week. Um, Jason and Cammie, thank you so much for being here with us. And um, yeah, everyone have a good rest of your week. Thank you. Have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you.